Hello, this is Dr. Anthony Delmond. Last time we were talking about management's role in a business, and we started talking about ethics. We want to continue that conversation now. We began with a discussion of the ethical development that people go through, but how do our categorizations, how do our ethics actually evolve in general? Does it come from uh, our friends? Does it come from family, uh, faith, or the media? Uh, or public policy and laws. Do we get our ethics from uh, societal norms? What do you think? Well, research says that the majority of people, uh, ethics, their ethics are most heavily influenced by the media. Uh, that is, TV, internet, uh, books, music, uh, and social media now to a, a large degree. Uh, public policy and laws affect our ethics as well. And family is the last one. Note uh, that friends are not a specific influence, and uh, church and faith are not a specific influence here. Although you get a lot of that same material from uh, family and media, especially now that social media kind of dominates the media market. Now, you may have heard the term top-down management. Uh, there's a top-down approach to good behavior. A lot of our behavior is mirrored from those above. Uh, if your parents are very ethical people, you will mirror that behavior and be ethical. You'll copy their behavior. Uh, so the same is true in the business world. If uh, the upper echelon, the upper management CEO, uh, and, and uh, even mid-level managers are very ethical and they do what, uh, what they want other people to do, uh, the employees below them will do those things. So for the most part. Uh, so a, a CEO that's ethical is more likely to have ethical managers and uh, ethical employees because he's leading by example. Are businesses always ethical? Well, we've already talked about some examples where they're not. Um, some highly visible ones are Enron, WorldCom, and Facebook. Um, maybe to some degree Google as well. Uh, but some of the lesser known ones, uh, Nike, Cracker Barrels had some, some ethical issues, uh, and Amazon has had some ethical issues as well. Um, some of the most common unethical practices at the company level uh, are defrauding investors or customers, unethical accounting, uh, where uh, they're not properly sharing how much money they made. Uh, this can lead to tax fraud. Um, defamation, uh, selling customer data, and negligence. These are things that businesses do uh, that affect their stakeholders like customers, uh, the government, shareholders, and so on. Uh, there are also some uh, examples of unethical behavior uh, at the uh, lower levels, like marketing and sales. Uh, some of those are bribery, making false or misleading product claims, price discrimination. Uh, we'll talk a little about each of these in turn. Uh, Tie-in sales, exclusive dealership, reciprocal buying, uh, and including hidden terms in user agreements. Uh, this is stuff that is at the maybe salesperson level. A uh, salesperson might uh, accept bribes to give lower uh, prices to certain individuals, buyers. Um, but these are, again, at the, the lower level. So a bribe is a gift that someone gives to influence someone else's behavior. Uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, said that I believe this was as of 2020 or 2021, the uh, uh, bribes and kickbacks account for $27 billion of the annual $50 billion in white-collar crime. So bribes are huge. Uh, and this can happen at the contract level. So a salesperson might be selling to uh, a large buyer, and maybe they only have a certain amount that they can, that they can sell, uh, and they take a contract, maybe take a bribe to, to give a contract uh, to a certain buyer based on their own incentives. Misrepresentation is another big issue in the sales process. This is where a salesperson uh, makes an unsubstantiated claim about a product. Uh, this product will uh, save your company three million dollars a year. Well that's a pretty specific statement. If you can't meet that statement, obviously that's going to be a misrepresentation case. Uh, so generally, salespeople are better off using very vague statements 
uh, opinions. I think this product will do great things for your company in terms of lowering costs. That's not something you can really tie to numbers, and it's an opinion. Uh, so sticking to proven facts is important. If you can't back it up with facts, if you can't prove it, uh, don't say it. Um, salespeople tend to get wrapped up in the moment, especially when they are starting out, uh, and you can get some uh, momentum going and maybe misrepresent yourself or your product. So you need to be very careful, especially as you're starting out. Price discrimination is when a company sells a product for different prices to different buyers. Uh, this can be legal or illegal, depending on the situation. First degree price discrimination, uh, also called perfect price discrimination, is when the seller charges every customer exactly what they're willing to pay for a product. Uh, this is not a very realistic thing because we don't know what people are typically willing to pay for their products. But if you could price discriminate and charge everybody exactly what they're willing to pay, their largest amount they would pay, you could make a lot of money, but this is illegal. You can't charge everybody a different price based on what they're willing to pay. Uh, that's when you get into price gouging and issues that lead to jail time, uh, or at least large fines. Secondary price discrimination is when the seller charges different prices for different quantities. This could be something like a bulk or quantity discount. Uh, this is fine. You can do this. Uh, third degree price discrimination, the legality depends. So this is when a seller is uh, charging different prices to different consumer groups or demographics. Uh, typically, we think about this in terms of uh, pricing by age groups uh, or memberships. So think about going to the movies. If you're a student, you're going to pay a student rate, right? Is it legal for them to charge you a lower rate as a student? Sure, it's legal. Uh, but they are classing you into a certain demographic and charging you based on that. Uh, same thing for senior discounts. Uh, that's perfectly legal. It's fine. Uh, but if you were to go into other demographic groups, uh, maybe not based on age, then you might get into some trouble. Uh, you should be able to think of examples of each one of these. I'll let you do that on your own. Um, so some other unethical practices, uh, some illegal, some not. Uh, involve buyer and seller obligations. So a tie-in sale is when there's a contractual arrangement between the buyer and seller that requires the buyer to purchase additional products uh, to the one that they that they want. Uh, a lot of times sellers will want to unload some inventory they can't get rid of, so they uh, allow the buyer to get a nice rate on something that they do want, but they have to take some of what they don't want in addition to it. Uh, this is typically illegal, uh, but a lot of businesses get away with it. Exclusive dealership uh, sets up a contract where uh, resellers can't purchase products from competing sellers. So, for example, if uh, a company wanted to sell its product at Walmart, a contract with exclusive dealership would say that Walmart can't buy any similar products from other companies and sell them to its final buyers. Uh, this is usually more useful for smaller resellers, uh, so kind of mom and pop uh, convenience stores and things, requiring them to only buy uh, products from, uh, from certain manufacturers. Uh, reciprocal buying is an arrangement where a seller agrees to buy a product from one of its customers in exchange for a sale. Again, this is frowned upon. Sometimes it's an ethical violation. It's always an ethical violation. Uh, sometimes it's also illegal, depending on the case. So those are some outward-facing ethics violations, ones that uh, face the outside world, ones that affect customers. But there's also some internal violations. Uh, there's a lot of unethical practices that happen just inside the workplace. Uh, we think immediately about sexual harassment and workplace discrimination. Uh, but providing poor working conditions, we talked about Nike before, mistreating labor, uh, mismanagement. Uh, how can we control these in the workplace? Well, this is where businesses can create a code of ethics. So some standards that people have to live by that sort of encapsulate the business's professional moral code, essentially. So it takes what the business feels are, is right and wrong, and it puts it into, translates it into some kind of a uh, specific guide. Now, uh, there are a couple different ways that these can be created. 
Uh, but essentially, a code of ethics is just a formal statement of a company's values uh, concerning ethics and social issues. Uh, one of the nice things that businesses can do with this is then if they want to fire somebody because the person has been violating uh, the business's position on certain behaviors, it has a list of those behaviors and it can pretty easily put a case together. Uh, so there's two ways that these come. One is a principle-based code of ethics. These are set up to uh, affect corporate culture and define fundamental values, but they don't uh, outlines specific activities that people can and can't do. Uh, it sort of outlines what they would like to see in terms of behavior. So uh, treating customers well, uh, providing quality products, but not here's what you do in each situation. Policy-based codes of ethics are specific situations uh, outlined. So uh, what the consequences are for sexual harassment and what defines sexual harassment. That would be in a policy-based code of ethics. But a principle-based code of ethics might be, uh, don't sexually harass anybody. We don't like that. So a little bit, uh, a little bit more specific for the policy-based codes of ethics. And this is really easy for then uh, terminating an employee who doesn't follow those rules. Uh, to enforce a code of ethics, businesses can do a few things. One, they can establish an ethics committee. This is a group that sets the guidelines and monitors how well people are behaving within those guidelines. Uh, another thing businesses could do is they could employ an ethics ombudsperson. Uh, this is not a real person. This is an office that acts as a go-between when settling ethical disputes between employees. So if one employee feels that they've been harassed uh, in the workplace, uh, maybe, maybe sexually, maybe otherwise, uh, the two would work with the ethics ombudsperson, that office, uh, and uh, determine who's at fault and what needs to be done. Uh, a business can also encourage and protect whistleblowers. Those are the employees who call out unethical or illegal practices within the business. Uh, this is something that is good to have in a business because it makes sure that the business is uh, behaving, that people within the business are behaving. Uh, so whistleblowers are not a bad thing necessarily. If you have a lot of whistleblowers coming out in a company, that typically shows that there's something wrong with what's happening internally there. Uh, and then you can maintain and develop control systems. Uh, this is uh, a set of methods to root out unethical behavior. So how do you find falsified reports, bribes, and all of that? Uh, if you, as a business, want to find those things, you create a control system to watch out for it. Uh, a lot of times this is process documentation. Uh, and then again, your code of ethics that outlines what happens when people break the rules. There's also some external enforcement. That's all the stuff that a business can do internally, but there's also some external stuff. Uh, so government keeps an eye on businesses, especially as they get larger. Uh, at the highest level, antitrust legislation attempts to limit market power for any single firm. It reduces the ability for businesses to become monopolies because monopolies uh, will raise prices and treat external customers poorly. Uh, antitrust legislation has been used against telecom companies uh, and most recently against social media and internet giants. Uh, I think that probably in the next few years we'll see uh, some antitrust cases aimed at food and agricultural corporations, so ag business, uh, as they're becoming more and more consolidated. Still at a really high level, we have uh, laws that are guiding how accounting is done uh, to make sure that, that businesses aren't defrauding uh, shareholders. Uh, one example is the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, uh, SOX Act of uh, 2002. I worked uh, for a while for Unitron Insurance, and we had a whole SOX team uh, that was working on uh, building our record retention requirements to make sure that we were SOX compliant. Um, but basically, this is just a set of rules for how long you need to keep all your tax documents and how much you need to print and where they need to go so that you can be monitored uh, as a business to make sure that you're not defrauding anyone. Uh, back at the sales level, there's some external enforcement too uh, with uh, laws created by government to kind of guide uh, what salespeople can do. One, are, one set is cooling off laws. Um, cooling off laws are 
uh, a way that customers have some control over uh, whether or not they keep products that they get excited about and then buy without thinking ahead. So when salespeople go door to door, uh, they might get a customer very excited about a product and the customer buys something they maybe can't afford or don't really want, but they were swept away in the moment. So cooling off laws allow for a customer to have usually a three-day period uh, where they can return a product with no consequence. So they can cancel a contract, return merchandise, and get a full refund. Uh, so this really tends to protect uh, customers that get swept away. Uh, Green River ordinances, uh, these require salespeople to get licenses to be able to sell in cities where they don't live. So if they're not residents, they need to pay a license fee. Uh, not all places have enacted these. Uh, but this idea came from Green River, Wyoming, um, where they wanted to protect their both their customers, so their, their regular uh, residents, but it also protects salespeople from that area because it means that they don't have competition from the outside. Uh, those license fees then go back into taxes and can be redistributed to customers in the area as well. So it's kind of a double uh, benefit to folks in that area. All right. I think we'll come back and do this last section uh, in the next set.